Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Anita McCuit, and I am the president of the Canadian Club of Toronto. You're joining us for our first event of our 124th season, and I'm so proud to be kicking it off with an important and urgent discussion that really needs to be held. The lack of racial diversity and the presence of systemic racism is a not so secret reality in Canada, in corporate Canada in particular, despite the fact that many Canadians still say, we don't have racism here in Canada. You only need to look at the boards and executive management teams of our most prominent companies to see that there is an issue. And yet attempts to address this deep-seated inequality has not resulted in lasting or even discernible change. Black North Initiative is committed to changing that. The Black North Initiative is a council dedicated to holding corporations accountable for ending anti-Black racism in their organizations. And we have over 2,000 viewers tuned in right now to hear more about the action that they can take in their own organizations. Before we dive into today's topic, here's some information about how you can participate with us. If you find that your internet is slow, press the click here to switch stream <coughs> button. The video quality may decrease, but the audio should stay strong. If you have questions, just click the questions tab and enter your questions in the window and they will be sent to today's moderator. The request help button is located at the bottom right corner of the page and it's for technical support. Thank you to today's event sponsors, BLG, Morneau Chappelle, PwC and Scotiabank. The Canadian Club is a nonprofit and we've been gathering people for over 124 years. And it's because of our sponsors that we're able to continue to do that, especially during these uh, trying times. We are grateful for your support for today's important discussion. Now to introduce today's speakers. Rola Dagger is the president and CEO of Cisco Canada and co-chair of the Black North Initiative. Wes Hall is the executive chairman and founder of Kingsdale Advisors and the founder and chair of the Black North Initiative. Following Wes and Rola's remarks, we'll move to our panel discussion featuring Andrea Barrett, the CEO of Diversity Agency and the president of the Canadian Black Chamber of Commerce, the Honorable Dr. Oliver, Do, Dr. Donald Oliver, retired Senator, having served 23 years in the Canadian Senate, and David Simmons, Senior Vice President, Communications and Public Affairs, McKesson, Canada, and President-elect of the Canadian Club Toronto. And today's moderator, moderator is Dwight Drummond, host, CBC Toronto News. One of the club's traditions that has not changed in all of these years is that we start every event by making a toast to our country. Usually done in person with the clinking of a glass. Let's make a nod towards the screen and if you've got a glass nearby, raise it and toast to Canada. To Canada. Canada. Wes and Rola, I will turn the Canadian Club podium over to you. Anita, thank you so much, and uh, certainly appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with uh, with everyone today and talk a little bit about the uh, Black North Initiative. So the question on everyone's mind is really how this thing came about and uh, how did we get here? We got here because of the fact that um, uh, you know Black people over the, the the centuries, quite frankly, in this country, have been treated poorly. But uh, the situation that happened with George Floyd which is a combination of us being cooped up as a result of COVID-19 and uh, seeing the humanity uh, that's happening around us in terms of how we treat our elderly, the way we treat our poor, and in particular, the way we treat black people, it really came to light as a result. And uh, we really saw something that was really horrific, which is uh, the murder of someone in broad daylight in a very uh, a gruesome way and it looks the person committed a murder was someone that was sent there to protect him. And uh, essentially he was uh, murdered in a way whereby the person doing the crime was actually uh, supported by others. And it looked like he could have been smoking a cigarette while he was uh, doing this crime. 
And so any uh, decent human being looking at that situation uh, would be affected by it. But imagine if you're from that race or if you're from that religion and you look at that, how much more of an impact that that would have on you seeing one of your fellow uh, member of your race or your religion being slaughtered in public. But it's not the first time it happened. It happened consistently. So uh, what happened in my case was that I was busy managing through COVID-19 like everybody else and uh, dealing with all the different issues surrounding it. Uh, I was on the board of, uh, I'm on the board of uh, a number of foundations and we had all these board meetings that week. And uh, when I saw the video, because someone said, just watch the video, Wes. And I said, no, no, I've seen the video before, but I thought it was another video. And, uh, and it shows how callous we've become. And after seeing the video, uh, it really changed my life in the sense that I couldn't really go back to doing normal things anymore. And the interesting thing about that video was that now we're seeing companies making statements. The question is, why is it that it's taken now for them to make statements? For example, you have black employees and you see the plight of black people. It's played out on the TV screens almost on a nightly basis. And uh, as the CEO of your company, you did not send a message to all your employees to let them know that what you're seeing in public is deplorable and it's against your, your being, it's against everything that you stand for as a business leader and that you're going to do something about it. That would be a strong message to send to your black employees if you had sent something like that out and not wait until there is outrage and protest in the street before you actually take a position on the issue. So after writing, uh, so after seeing what happened, I said, I can't really stay quiet anymore. I have to write an article about it. And I wrote an article and it was put in the front page of the Global Mail. And you have to understand that it wasn't easy to write that article because historically, when black people spoke out, uh, they were penalized uh, as a result. We saw John Carlos and Thomas Smith in the 1960 Olympics when they put their fist up. We saw Muhammad Ali. We saw um, Martin Luther King Jr. and most recently Colin Kaepernick. And Colin Kaepernick was peacefully protesting uh, uh, the, the, what was happening against black people in this country. And he was one of the best quarterbacks in the league, top five. And as a result, he couldn't work for, he couldn't play for the worst team in the league after what happened to him. So I really saw no examples of business leaders, unfortunately, that were in a position to not only speak up, but get their voices heard. Because it's one thing to speak up, but to actually get your voice heard. And so when I wrote that op-ed, um, I was sitting in my backyard, wondering what the consequences were going to be. And, um, and I got a call from, the first call I got was from Victor Dodig, as I wrote in a subsequent article. And he asked, what can I do? Now, you got to understand how much, uh, how much I appreciated that call because, first of all, I didn't know what the response was going to be. And secondly, he didn't call and say, you know, I'm a CEO with all the answers. Here's what we're, you should do. He said he was vulnerable and he said, what can I do? And that meant a lot. I got a call from uh, Prem Watsa. He said, Wes, can I come over to your house? And he came over. And he said to me something very profound. He said, you know, I'm an Indian man. I've been in this country for a long time. I've built a lot of wealth for myself. I know black people face a lot of issues. But until your article, I didn't get it. And uh, uh, Roller Dagger called me. She's on, the, on, on, on me with, uh, here with me today. And she asked the same question. So we said, let's form this council. We're going to call it the Canadian Council of Business Leaders Against Anti-Black Systemic Racism. But because that's a mouthful, we're going to call it Black North. We're going to use a uniquely Canadian, prob, uh, uh, Canadian solution to solve a problem. So we go, as business leaders, we're going to use the same approach that we've seen in trying to solve COVID-19 and use that same business approach where we actually work collectively together to solve a social problem. So seven weeks ago, we thought that we couldn't leave our homes because we thought we were going to die. And because we work collectively we're now in a position where our businesses are open up and the economy is, uh, is getting back again. So we go, why don't we use the same approach to solve this problem? Let's look at a, use a social, a business approach to solve this social problem. Now, one of the things that we're hearing from people is we're gonna do our own thing, right? Let's assume, for example, that with COVID-19, 
every business say, we're going to do our own thing, right? We're going to um, you know, open when we want to. We're going to let our employees come and go when they want because we're just going to do our own thing. We're going to come up with our own solution. We would be still dealing with the ravages of COVID-19. We would be still stuck in our homes as a result of that approach. But we knew that we had to work collectively to solve that pandemic. Black anti-black systemic racism is a pandemic. It's a pandemic. And just like COVID-19 to solve that pandemic, we have to work collectively. We cannot do it in isolation or else it will never happen. Now, I do appreciate that companies are big and they have their own approach to things, but at the end of the day, it, we didn't use that excuse with COVID-19. We didn't say, well, my company's too small, I can't close it down for a week. Or my company's too big, I can't do all those different things. We did the right thing and we beat this thing in a record period of time. We never thought we'd get here seven weeks ago. We can do the same with anti-Black systemic racism. We have to work collectively. So why do we have this pledge? So because of the fact that we're getting together as business leaders to solve the social problem, we go first, we have to make sure our own house is in order. We can't go out and start to criticize other people and, and yet we ourselves have the problems internally. So we go, let's look at our house, look at the top of our company at the board, are there black people there? And if there aren't, is there a systemic reason behind it? Then look one down at the C-suite, are there black people there? And if there aren't, is there a systemic reason then we look into the pipeline. If there aren't Black people there, is there a systemic reason? And then we fix those problems. But we have to recognize the fact that our employees must now get into the real world and leave our company. And we now, they're going to be subject to the justice system, the education system, the health system. Are there systemic impediments in those systems to our employees that actually prejudice our employees? And if that's the case, we must use our clout as corporate leaders to remove those barriers so that things are a little bit easier for employees. So really at the end of the day, that is what this whole initiative is all about. It's not to name and shame. It's really to get together with like-minded people to solve a very critical problem, which is anti-Black systemic racism. And I do believe that if we use our collective efforts, if we work together, if we put all the ego aside and all the bureaucracy that we use, just like we put them aside with COVID-19, we can have some marvelous results in a short period of time. Thank you, Wes. And now you know why I could not say no to this. And I am part of this amazing, amazing movement and initiative. So thank you for having me, Anita. And uh, welcome to all our viewers and listeners. Um, so in March, uh, we fell asleep and woke up to a brand new world um, that we've experienced for the last four months. If you have told me last year I would be spending half of 2020 in a virtual world, I would have never, ever believed it. The pandemic has turned everything upside down, but we aren't fighting one virus. Uh, Wes just talked about it. The truth is we are fighting two strong viruses, COVID-19 and systemic racism. Unfortunately, and the sad part is we don't have a vaccine for either virus. The murders of innocent people in the U.S. has shaken us to our core. It, it reminded us if we want to eliminate the virus of racism, we have to stand up against injustice in the status quo now. These moments are watershed moments for all of us. And it's time to seize this moment to do better for black Canadians, period. Starting now, we need to action because words and intentions are not enough. Let's be honest, although we have done a, a a good and okay job, we've made progress over the years, we have not done enough, and we failed the Black community in Canada. As a technology leader myself, I truly believe technology could play a huge role in helping bridge the divide by providing opportunities, because technology on its own, it's great, but we can't do it alone. Tech technology today is the enabler, but people are still the transformers for everything that we do. 
and change need to start with people and leadership. Hence the reason why all of you leaders today on the call. We have to remember one thing that is so important. If it's not your struggle, it does not mean it does not exist. It exists. The pain of all of us today is the power of us tomorrow. After the murder of George Floyd, Cisco took a public stands globally and our chairman and CEO Chuck Robbins was the first leader to stand up and say no more. Over 70,000 Cisco employees took a part of an open and an uncomfortable conversation about racism with leaders from the black community by creating a safe environment for a transparent discussion. And I tell you, at Cisco, diversity is not a box we check. We don't just pay lip service because we believe in full spectrum diversity because it's not just the right thing to do. It is absolutely the smartest thing to do for any leader for any business period. Companies with an inclusive culture are six times more likely to be innovative. Yes, six times. We unveiled our new purpose a few weeks ago, and I absolutely loved it with passion, and it is to power an inclusive future for all. And we believe there's four pillars that could help. Number one is how do we provide technology to connect the unconnected? We look at the indigenous community in Canada. We have been a part of that for almost 10 years. How we connect over 20,000 students in the indigenous community because we believe every child, every kid in Canada deserves an opportunity to learn. Um, CAMH, the Center of Mental Health, we all know how mental health has taken a priority in our health period during the pandemic by offering virtual care to marginalized people in the community. When we talk about skilling of the future, our Cisco Networking Academy is an amazing, amazing program where we partners with we partner with organization like Empower and Life Science. Lifeline Syria to Yes, I can. I, uh, I, I know what uh, Rola is going to say. So uh, uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, what uh, Rola's uh, point is that uh, there's a lot of uh, partnership that uh, they were able to have through Cisco uh, as a result of, uh, of this Black North initiative, not just the Black North initiative, but generally speaking, uh, change of the conversation as it relates to Black, uh, black people. Uh, but what I want to highlight, uh, though, with respect to the the supports that we've been getting uh, from across corporate Canada is Eric, you, did I miss you guys for a minute. There you go. You pause for, for, for a second, but we, we got All it. right. Sorry about that. Um, I, I have to tell you guys We're about partnership I, for all that you paused the partnership. Yes. Uh, I, I have to tell you guys, um, I am so proud to be part of this. As a proud Lebanese that came to this country, a proud Lebanese and a grateful Canadian, um, I immigrated to Canada 31 years ago. I settled into an economy that was set for one demographic only. I fought my way through the system and succeeded, but it was not easy. There was nothing easy about it. But along the way, people of color took a chance on me empowered me and inspired me. So we today need to focus on reinventing ourselves and build an, an inclusive innovation economy. We have to hold each other accountable and we cannot go back to our original DNA, which is the easy thing and the comfortable thing to do. Leadership is not a title that you have, it's actually an action. Canadian leaders need to act now Corporate Canada cannot outsource this responsibility. We need to do it together because no one can do it alone. The power of we, just like was, what was talked, 
is not just me. I can't do it. Wes cannot do it alone. It's we. Because the Black community cannot just do something on their own. The NGOs can't do it. The government cannot do it alone. It's all of us. The work we're actually doing at Black North is not easy, nor comfortable. But I have to tell you, comfort and growth do not coexist. With my title comes a platform, and I'm using this platform to create a better Canada and should all of us. Our past should never define us, but it can help us shape our actions. We need to learn from the past, edit the future. And my ask today with Wes is for all of us to get comfortable with being uncomfortable and join us in powering this transformational change. Remember, that's what I love about Canada. That's what I love about awesome leaders is we own the pen to write our future, but we own the editing rights every day to make Canada a better place for our next generation period. Um, and now I'd love to pass it on to the awesome Dwight, over to you. Thank you for that, Rola. Thank you for that, Wes. And thank you for this Black North Initiative and to the Canadian Club for hosting us this afternoon for this very important conversation. Joining us on this conversation, we have Andrea Barrett, Diversity Agency Press and also Canadian Black Chamber of Commerce Press. We have the Honorable Dr. Donald H. Oliver, CMQC, retired Senator of Canada, also a member of the Nova Scotian community, one of the oldest Black communities in this country. And of course, David Simmons, also from the Canadian Club and McKesson, Canada. Let's get right into this conversation. Um, Andrea, I would like to start with you. The Canadian Black Chamber of Commerce is trying to show corporate Canada that success in the Black business community will lead to a stronger and more successful overall Canadian economy. It really seems like common sense, but how difficult has it been for you to try to convince corporate Canada as you try to help Canadian, Black Canadian businesses across this great country of ours? Thank you, Dwight, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's a really great experience to be here. In regard to that question, we have had some challenges at the Canadian Black Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I remember when we first started, we had people asking, why do you need a Black Chamber of Commerce? Why, like, why do you even exist? The problem is there are fantastic Black businesses right across the country that are just looking for opportunity. You'll find that we are unrepresented in other chambers and boards of trades, and we just want an opportunity to connect with Corporate Canada to let them know that exactly what Rola said, having diversity in your organization all the way down, including in your supply chain. We wanna be your consumers, we wanna be your suppliers. It just makes better business sense. It really does. The Honorable Dr. Donald H. Oliver, um, you know, Black people have been in this country for a very long time. They say Matthew da Costa was part of the exploring party that sailed from France to the New World. That was in the 17th century. He was the first recorded Black person in this territory that would become Canada. So I have to ask you, how does it take until 1990 for someone like yourself to be summoned to the chamber as the first Black man in Canadian history to become a senator in this country? Well, uh I'm from Nova Scotia, and and we've been living with uh, with slave slavery for over two, two centuries. And when Matthew da Costa came, it was wonderful that he was black because he could speak more more than two languages, and uh, he made a great contribution as a black man to Nova Scotia, even in a period of slavery. And that has made a big difference. But my grandfather and grandmother on both sides of my family came from slave plantations in the United States. And so they came to Nova Scotia and to Canada and brought a tradition of slavery. And we have risen from that to, uh, to find that uh, it's possible to make it in positions like the state of Canada. And uh, it's, it's wonderful, but we still have an awful lot of work to do to make this, these kinds of opportunities more available to more of our Black youth. We're hoping to have a conversation with you because we know you've been in this fight for decades now. Some of us are, are newbies to this when it comes 
to comparison to you. Um, David, the Diversity Advancement Network puts you on their list of 100 top Black Canadians. You have advised our provincial government on efforts to combat anti-Black racism. You're president-elect now of the club that is hosting us this afternoon. Uh, I wonder if you're the first Black president. You can speak to that. You're also a sought-after public speaker who has been seemingly able to crash through some of these glass ceilings that exist for people of color in corporate Canada. I'm hoping that this afternoon that you'll share some of your strategies with us for that success. Uh, thanks for, for uh, the question and, and thanks for everyone who's joined. I'm, I'm not the first back president, thankfully. Marianne Chambers uh, was president. Oh, that's right, from Scotia Bank, yes. Yeah, so the Chambers, uh, the Chambers probably take that one from us, uh, uh, follow in, in, in important footsteps. I think when we think about navigating corporate organizations, some of the best advice I got was from leaders who were different. They weren't black, but they were different. And, and they came to me and they said, we see something special in you and we need you to run into that. Uh, and I wasn't really sure about that. And I'll, I'll call two of them out. One of them uh, was an openly uh, gay uh, executive conservative strategist. He was president of the Canadian club. Jamie Watt said to me one day, you know, if you don't own who you are, then you might as well stop. Uh, and if you moderate and mediate who you are, you might as well stop. And he said, I may never understand what it's like to be black, but I knew what it's like to be the, the person in the room who's different. Uh, and so make that a strength. And then I, I did, I worked with him and, and I was unapologetic about being me because I was being mentored by somebody who was unapologetic about being him. And when I left Navigator, I came to McKesson and I worked for a Francophone female executive who again, kind of looked at me, Geneviève, she said, you know, there's something special about you. So I'm going to invest in you. I'm going to help mentor you. And I'm going to speak up for you. I'm going to sponsor you. And I, I think to executives who, who may be on this call uh, who are not black and thinking about what they can do, sponsorship is a very powerful tool in corporate organizations. You know, I look at someone like Rola, she has the power to pound her fist in a meeting and say, I'm going to take a risk on this person. I'm going to invest in this person so they can accelerate their career. And I challenge all of you as, as West issue to call around Black North to look for directors and senior executives. We're not going to get there if you don't pull us forward. The talent's there, but you need a magnet to pull us forward. So I'm grateful to them, among many others, who've been investing in me. But but that's been a, a key tool is to be sort of unapologetic about it, but have that sort of safety net to know that there's someone behind you uh, in the process. We have a lot of folks joining us this afternoon. We want to welcome and thank them. And they're sending in their questions already fast and furious here. So let's get right to some of these audience questions. Um, this one could be to all three of our panelists. If you could direct your non-Black colleagues to one resource, book, movie, article, et cetera, to, be, to begin addressing systemic racism, what would it be? Because after George Floyd, I can't tell you the number of colleagues outside of my community who reached out to me, white friends to say, Do I, what can I read to help understand? Where can I go to get information? Because uh, I want to be an ally, but I need better understanding. Any suggestions? Well, I have I, suggestions. Oh, go ahead. Oh, Andrea. All right, I'll just jump in real quick. I love that question and Dwight, I can completely resonate. After this, the murder of George Floyd, the Canadian Black Chamber of Commerce, we were inundated with phone calls and emails, people asking questions, looking for help. Always reach out to us if you're looking for resources or information, but I would also wanna just point out what was mentioned earlier. Many, many people don't know that Matthew DaCosta was the first black man in Canada. So I just say, reach out and source any, uh, reach out to the Ontario Black History Society for information and, and find out how it all started, where we were, the businesses we started, the professions we were in, how Toronto got to become the great city that it is. So that's my first suggest suggestion, to reach out to us at the Chamber or the Ontario Black History Society. Yeah, the, the history is there. It is not in if you really want to look for it, Senator. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say something a bit different. And uh, as Wes said at the very beginning, and I want to thank Wes for bringing this initiative and being the catalyst for being in this initiative and also for be, being the inspiration for all of us in Canada. And this time there's going to be a big change. And when this is over, Wes, Canada is going to be a very, very different place. And, and but I rather than read a black book, I think that um, white people should be reading some white books by New York Times leading authors 
who have written out things like white privilege, because as Wes and everyone else has said today, we don't have to go back and rehash the stories of what is systemic racism against blacks, because we know we could sit here and give you 15 or 20 stories very easily of things that have happened in our own lives. But yes. that's us. So now the burden has left the blacks because we our case is known and the burden is on whites and they have to learn about white privilege and white privilege is, is that thing that's been given to them that has been unearned and gives them all the privileges in corporate Canada to have more power and to have more access to resources to make life easy. That is to get, when it's time for a big, big promotion in a corporation, white privilege lets them be first in line. So that's the kinds of books that I think they should be reading. Thank you for that. David, do you want to comment before we move on to the next one? Sure. I'd say I think the, the senator's recommendation, the book is actually called White Privilege, and I would encourage everyone to read it. Um, I think the, the other component of that is to read the history of our country and take stock of the absence of Black stories. Knowing that Matthew DeCoste has been in our country since the, the French sailed across, and yet our stories aren't in the textbooks as a telling example of privilege. Uh, you know, Wes, Wes and I uh, are not, I don't think we look the same. We're both probably handsome. I'll give him that. Um, <laughs> uh, Wes, when I was consulting, Wes's firm and our, the firm I was at were working on a project, uh, two very different spaces. He was doing the proxy work. We were doing the communications work. I walked into a boardroom in TD Tower, and I'm a little bit younger than Wes. We're both, I'm from Jamaica, but we're a little bit younger. And this executive came to me and spoke to me like I worked at Kingsdale and was telling me all this information about Kingsdale and assumed that I was Wes Hall. Uh, and, you know, if you want to talk about privilege, imagine what that, imagine your child or your brother or your husband walks into a room and the assumption is that because he's black, he must be Wes Hall. So I think, you know, when I talk to my corporate colleagues, I say that, that I am often the only person in the room and that's exhausting. It's a room. It's not fair. I do the work anyway, but there's that, there's these gentle reminders of the fact that this is the lived reality that we're talking about. And so there is a bit of a difference and we want to take stock of it. Another audience question. You know, I work in the media. I understand the attention span of the media and how our gaze shifts from moment to moment. This question says, what is different this time around? We watched the LA riots and we watched Ferguson pass by with little systemic change. So what is it about this moment in time that is going to change the way business and society deal with anti-black racism? What is different this time? I'm not allowed to answer. Jump in, <laughs> Russ. Okay, um, so what's different? Um, um, what's different is that uh, COVID-19 is different. COVID-19 made it different. COVID-19 opened our eyes and ears to the injustices of humanity. COVID-19 allows us to see that we're treating our, uh, our elderly very poorly. It allows us to see that we're treating our poor people very poorly. It allows us that we have a significant race problem in this country. And, uh, and because of the fact that it's a combination of us being glued to our television and just watching what was going on that just go, wait a minute here, was I watching this all along? Yes, you were, you were just desensitized. And, uh, you know, so what's different this time around? It will be the same if we allow it to be the same. If we let this moment pass, then there's a problem, you know, for us, for letting that moment pass. So what I'm saying is this, that we are seizing this opportunity and we're not making it into a news cycle, right? We've done an incredible amount of work in three weeks and, uh, and we have a, still a lot of work to be done in the future. But I think what happened was that these young people, in particular, young white privileged kids, saw what was going on and they go to their moms and dads who are in privileged position and go, this is unacceptable. Can you do something about it? And they, the response from their parents was very disappointing to them. And it caused those young white kids to go in the streets and march even though they're risking dying from a pandemic because they go, this is unacceptable mom and dad. And if you don't do something about it, I'm gonna do something about it. 
And as a result of that, uh, you know, these leaders are paying attention. Now think about the fact that, you know, uh, if you ask any of these leaders at the very top, how, if you went to Harvard or you went to Queens or you went to uh, Yale, whatever university you went to, how many black people were in your program? How many black people graduated with you? And then you ask yourself this question, why aren't they here with me? Why aren't they here as, as my 2IC? Why aren't they here as the third person in command at my company? Where are those bright people? Are they just all of a sudden become unambitious? Or is there a systemic reason that essentially streamed them out of these positions? And that's what comfort does to us, right? We forget that we are privileged people while, while we're rising up. And we have listed, we don't look at who is going down while we're coming up. And so what, what this has done to us is to say, let's open our eyes, let's look at the issue. Now let's talk about it. We've never talked about it before. We as black people haven't talked about it. Business leaders haven't listened to us because they didn't want to hear it. Now we're talking, now they're hearing. The question is, are they listening? And the future will tell. It, it really will, and hopefully this Black North Initiative will keep them on their toes uh, as we continue this fight. Uh, this next yeah. question I'd like yeah. to send to uh, Mr. Oliver. And it is something that comes up in our country quite a bit because your ancestors escaped to freedom in Canada. And there is this prevailing feeling that, you know, we are better than the U.S. We don't have those kind of systemic racism that exists south of the border. So this question from the audience says, how do you feel about assertions that anti-Black racism in Canada and Europe is less prevalent than it is in the U.S.? Is it less prevalent or is it just different? Uh, it's, it's just as prevalent and it's no different really. And I was born in 1938 and grew up in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and learned really in those post-war era times just what racism was all about. And when I was growing up in Halifax, for example, uh, young black children could not be uh, buried in a white cemetery. Black girls could not go to a hospital to get their designation to become an RN. And uh, we had segregated schools and seg segregated churches. We had Africville. And most of all, in our, our theaters that had an upstairs to downstairs, we black people had to be upstairs until a certain woman came along and couldn't look in the face of your $10 bills today and see what happened there. Yes, I, I, yes Desmond. we have racism in Canada, just as big and just as strong. And, uh, and I'm so happy uh, that uh, we're now have an organization that can go with it in a major way. And Dwight, maybe uh, I, could, I, just, I could just add a, a comment or two. Uh, slavery was abolished in Canada in 1834, right? It was abolished in the United States in 1865. We have ads in the Nova Scotia Gazette advertising Negro boys for sale and selling uh, chattels such as furniture and wagons and a Negro. So it's not a situation where, we're, we, you know, we're just, you know, if history was taught in school, everybody would know that. Right. But our history is not taught in school. So as a result of that, the rich contribution that we what, that we give to this society is gone. And the same thing with the indigenous community. So I think a part of systemic racism and getting rid of it is, first of all, teach us our history in schools. There's nothing to hide from that. We have a rich contribution to this society. Please give us our just deserve. Give us our credit. And then please allow us, us to have the same access to things that you take for granted. Give us the same opportunity to do that. We should not have to become rich before we get certain privileges. We should be able to be born with those privileges, just like anybody else in this country that were born with those privileges. Why should black people be born in this country and spend their entire life being treated like a second class citizen? We are children of the Commonwealth, our ancestors, paid into this empire with their blood, sweat, and tears. And I always say there's a reason there was a Bank of Nova Scotia in Kingston, Jamaica, before there was one in Toronto. There's a reason for that. Um, let's continue with this question here. And I think maybe David or, or Andrew could speak to this one. The question is, are there any Canadian organizations that you think are doing a good job at addressing anti-Black racism internally? 
Yes. So that's a question that we've been asked a lot recently. So we know there was Blackout Tuesday and a lot of corporations supported that initiative by on their social media with a, a blackout, but sort of it just ended there. So we're looking for action. We're looking for companies that have uh, publicly declared they're going to be making changes internally. So when we when I read Wes's article and the creation of the Black North Initiative, completely on board personally and the Canadian Black Chamber of Commerce is 100% behind this organization. So we look at organizations that are going to incorporate Black businesses in their supply chain that are going to start diversifying their boards. And as Wes mentioned, their C-suite is going to change. So I've seen some banks come out with public statements in the last couple of days talking about uh, percentages that they're going to start incorporating and including more Black people um, in their organizations and making sure that they promote within. I've seen corporations reach out to us at the chamber and other organizations with a financial donation and contribution. I, I want everyone to know that what we're doing is hard and we want to be treated just like everybody else. No one's looking for a handout. We're just looking for opportunity and want to be treated just like everyone else. So there are some companies doing a very good job of that. Thank you for that, Andrew. David, I do have another question for you unless you want to jump in on that one too. Okay. Um, this one for you, sir. This participant asks, how can or should I make the argument internally in my organization that we need to address anti-Black racism on its own versus all discrimination. Addressing diversity and inclusion in general. Are diversity and inclusion teams and corporations actually helping to dismantle anti-Black racism or are they just a band-aid solution? So I can speak from personal experience. Our DNI team at McKesson uh, does tremendous work um, helping to push a business case for diversity. And I think almost every leader on the screen has talked about the business case for diversity. Uh, diverse companies are more innovative, they're more inclusive, they tend to, to generate more value for shareholders and constituents. So I, I give d &I teams their credit for that. What I would say is that in Canada, we're wrestling to measure race, right? And I think Wes and, and, and Rola have started an initiative with their colleagues that help us measure, put numbers around black success and and promotions and, and those sorts of things. And so that's gonna help us uh, be able to quantify what we're doing. What I would challenge people to do internally, and this is a conversation I have with our CEO, is the business case for this is relevant, but the moral case is even stronger. And I think to, to Wes's point about George Floyd, when someone can be murdered in plain daylight, uh, it calls us to leadership. And you know, I had a conversation with our CEO and I said, the moment demands, that we look at this issue more intently and that we, we think about and we talk about the fact that this is happening in real life. And so it's the right thing to do. And if I reflect on the right thing to do and the progress that we've made on files, whether it's the Civil Rights Act in the United States, whether it's equal marriage in Canada for LGBT uh, Canadians, whether it's bilingualism, when we were able to hold this country together, those were all business cases, but it was the right thing to do for Canada. And I think we're at a moment now where we need to do the right thing and acknowledge that there are leaders who are ready to lead and we should put them in the position to, to do well. Go ahead, Wes. I don't want to take up the conversation here, uh, but um, so the question is really why not deal with other races and other cultures, right? The, the, you know, so people should ask themselves, who's at the bottom of the pile? If you want to help somebody at the very bottom, who would you help? You're going to go to the people at the very bottom, the blacks and indigenous at the very bottom. OK, yes. when all these order organizations are fighting for their rights and David mentioned about LGBTQ, for example, they were unapologetic as to what rights were fighting for, gay rights, and they received it. Uh, when in terms of uh, uh, the uh, gender rights, they were unapologetic uh, in terms of what rights were fighting for and they achieved it. But here's the issue with respect to gender diversity. Black women were not included in that discussion. Because if you look at all these boards and the C-suites, black women aren't there, right? So they were filtered out of that discussion as well. So let's talk, let, now we're talking about black rights and we're working with the indigenous people to get it. And now folks are saying, well, let's talk about everybody else. Who else has been killed in the streets, right? Who are, who's absent from the C-suite and the boardrooms? Blacks and indigenous. So I think they're deflecting when they use that discussion because it does not work. They use the same discussion when it comes to gender diversity and it didn't work then and it's not gonna work now. 
Now, when we talk about diversity and inclusion, every single company has a diversity and inclusion department for the last three, four years, okay? Why is it that they're hearing about the plight of their black employees for the first time now? You're supposed to have a diverse group and an inclusive group, but clearly the reason why you're hearing for the first time now is because you did not include blacks and you did not include indigenous people. So let's just solve for the problem we're trying to solve for. We're trying to solve for anti-black systemic racism. We're letting people know, and we all know that blacks and indigenous people are treated very differently in this country. No other race can claim that, none. You know, I was talking to a man, uh, uh, um, an Indian man the other day, and he said to me, you know, Wes, I've experienced racism. And I see this guy and, you know, I said, I'm going to get you. And 20 years later, I experienced it again and I dealt with that person. But I never felt the system was against me, right? The system is against Black people. <laughs> Let's say that. And if we don't solve for that, we're going to be here 30 years from now saying, why don't we talk about other people? It's a Black issue, and let's solve for that. And once we solve that, let's go to the Indigenous community and solve for that and raise both of us up. Yeah, we can still be fighting for basic humanity at this point. And I think you've answered this other question here. And it says, for companies balancing the needs of all equity-seeking groups, how can they be a part of this pledge and still respect the needs of other people of color? But I think you really touched right. on that. Maybe you or, or Wes Arola can speak to this one because it does, it seems people in the audience are, they're looking for specifics about the Black North Initiative. They, they want to know, um, uh, what does it say, what does Black North hope to accomplish and what does quantifiable, tangible progress actually look like? Are we looking for percentages for the company for, in these pledges? Exactly what are you hoping for from for, for corporate Canada? So Rola is going to talk about the, the corporate side, but here's what Black North is. It's not about putting Black people on boards and in C-suites only. That's a small part of what we're doing. We're building a modern day version of the NWCP and we're Canadianizing it, okay? We face systemic racism in every single aspect of this society. When we go get healthcare, we face it. When we go to schools, we face it. When we interact with governments, we face it at every level, provincial, federal, municipal. We face it when we go to not-for-profits. Uh, we face it everywhere in our society, okay? So what we're solving for through Black North is to identify all the systemic barriers to racism and dismantle them. The system was set up to exclude Black people. We know that. Let's acknowledge that. Let's now come up with solutions. But what happened in the U.S. when slavery was abolished? There's a law called the Jim Crow law that came into place to essentially replace slavery, right? Now, the same thing can happen in Canada because once we take one barrier down, there's going to be people who have no good intentions that's going to put some other barriers in place to replace that barrier that was taken down. So that's the reason why Black North has to be a living, breathing organization that is vigilant and will always look for uh, obstacles that are put in way to advance black people and work to eliminate it. When I'm dead 30 years, 40 years from now, there's gonna be Black North is still gonna be here. Rola can talk about the corporate side. So, uh, oh, we just lost Rola. I think David wanted so, uh, had um, something. It's the, uh -oh. the conversation, it is. Go ahead. Can you hear me Go okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, guys. This is what happens when they do construction on your street, and then the, you know, your internet keeps coming up and down. And I've called to get this fixed, and uh, God knows how long they're going to take to fix it. So my apologies about the connection. Um, like Wes said, I, it is it is hard to not do something about this as leaders. We're not always doing and saying the right things. We are learning through this process. And right now, as leaders, our job is to listen, learn, and lead through the experiences that the Black community is going. I tell you that 
um, you know, we've gone through so much and we've done so much, but this is an area where every single leader needs to be very uncomfortable of, uh, in, in get out of their comfort zone and be ready to be comfortable to speak up and to talk about this conversation and to listen to what the community needs. And it's, it's mind blowing when you hear that, you know, uh, there's no black CEOs in the uh, TSX 60. There is six senior black executives out of 799 executives in Canada. And there's four out of 680 board members. It's a problem. You know, yeah. this virus needs to stop because every single person in Canada needs an opportunity. Black people need the same opportunity like every single other person in the country, right? I, like I said, I came to this country, I, I felt racism as being an Arab woman and people call me a terrorist just because I'm from Lebanon. Right. And then you fight and you deal every day with it. And like all of you guys are saying, I am beyond shocked what Oliver said that they couldn't be buried. Kids couldn't be buried in the same. It's it's crazy. Like we that live in a history. world today that we need to do the right thing for the black community. And we failed the community. So therefore, every single CEO. And I know that Goldie Hyder has done an outstanding job with the Business Council of Canada and spoke to us the same week this um, this moment started to say to all corporate Canada, we need to stick together. And like uh, Wes said, if we don't stick together for COVID, we can't solve it. And if we can't stick together for Black people, we can't do it. So therefore, it's we versus I and me. Dwight, if I can, just uh, on that note, is I feel like there's always an undercurrent when we talk about uncomfortable conversations. The message I would leave colleagues who have the power to do what Rola is talking about is to remind everybody that we're not talking about a, a, a conversation of scarcity, right? We're talking about a conversation of abundance. We live in a society that has freedom and equality as hallmarks, so opportunity should be a hallmark. And we should be promoting that because you might be looking to lift the Black community up, it doesn't mean that you're not lifting others up too. So I just want to say that that's a yeah. that's fine yeah. And the, the great thing, Dwight, is the corporate Canada has responded so positively about this. It's amazing. I think at one time, Wes said, I can't keep up with all the CEO, your, <laughs> the CEOs that you're sending over because everybody's reaching out. This morning, I had one of the largest banks CEO call me to talk about what they're doing and how they can do it and what we need to do to help. So it is amazing to see how all the power of, of um, the corporations, all the big corporations and small that everybody wants to help, which is awesome. So now let's stick with it and let's go out there and execute on every promise that we're making to the community. And, and it is just so uh, important. And, and note that's important, you know, again, I can't stress this enough. And, and Rola pointed out again, I know that we want to solve problems on our own and go, we have our own thing and we just don't do things certain way. This is not a normal situation. It's not. COVID wasn't normal. We didn't take a normal approach to deal with COVID. We shut our businesses down and our revenue went to zero. When have we done that before? Never. Right? So, yes, we've been dealing with anti-Black systemic racism for a long time. So that's probably the reason why we're so cavalier about trying to solve the problem. Right? We've never dealt with COVID before. So we know we have to take drastic action. So let's put some urgency behind this. There is no benefit. If you really want to solve this problem, working in isolation gives you no benefit in solving the problem, period. It doesn't allow you to measure your success. It doesn't allow you to do anything because you're working in isolation. You can only say, I think this is what I've accomplished. But you don't know because there's no way to measure it. Through Black North, we're going to be able to measure our success. Everyone who is a part of the our CEOs. Could you imagine if you announced to the street that I'm not quite sure what my quarter is going to look like, right? And, uh, and, and there's no yardstick that you give to the market in terms of how you're going to perform, right? That is what you're doing when you do it in isolation because you're giving the Black community nothing to measure your success against. So it's just empty platitude. 
So all I'm saying to folks is that let's collectively work together. Black North is new. It was formed to deal with this issue and it will last only if you allow it to last. If you want it to die, you're gonna do, you're not gonna be a part of it. You're gonna make sure that you starve it of its, of its energy and it's gonna die. But we should want to pump all kinds of our effort and energy into this organization to give it the chance to survive. The black community is counting on that. And I'm here to help. And all the people that we announced on our board uh, today are here to help. And we want as many people as possible to join in that fight. Okay. Now we have some people on our panel today that have been part of this fight. I am conscious of the time. So I'm going to give our, our panelists some last words and we will start with Mr. Oliver. Thanks very much. Look, this has been a useful discussion. There's so much more that we should have said and could have said about next steps, but that will come later. But we also have to remember, even though we're talking about the corporate sector today, we have to include all of Canada. For instance, there are 300,000 public servants in Ottawa and across Canada who make public policies for Canada, who make the laws that deal with health care and, and the other things that are affecting Black people. And so we, we have to involve the bureaucracies in every province and territory in Canada, in addition to Bay Street and corporate Canada. Thank you very much. Andrea. Thank you, Dwight. One of the earlier questions you asked was, what's different about this time? Quite frankly, we're just fed up. We're, it's an emotional time. We're fed up, we're tired, we're frustrated. The Black North Initiative is something that is giving us hope and that we are looking forward to participating with. Again, the Canadian Black Chamber of Commerce is 100% behind the Black North Initiative. We're looking forward to the opportunity of partnering and working with Corporate Canada to make a better Canada. Thank you very much for your time and your efforts, David. Last word, sir. I'll be brief. I'll just... Um remind our community of leaders on Bay Street that we know what, what get me gets measured gets done. So let's continue to measure our success and our progress and initiatives like Black North will hold us accountable. Um, and the, the, the last thing I'll say is, you know, when I was growing up, my grandmother, I think there's a few Jamaican immigrants on, on this screen, uh, so I won't switch. Uh, she used to tell me <laughs> to hate up close. And so draw them in. And I'll, I'll challenge every white executive on Bay Street, and, and Rolla gave us the numbers, to draw the community in, to come up close. Don't just come and get on bad with us when you, when you like the music and the, and the environment. Come and actually experience, see, uh, and, and, and we'll be able to care deeply and make an impact on this. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged. Thank you to our panelists for their time. Andrew Barrett from the Black Chamber of Commerce, the Honorable Dr. David H. Oliver, CNQC. And of course, David Simmons from the Canadian Club and McKesson Canada. I would like to now thank you for allowing me to be part of this very important conversation. Thank you to Re Wes and Rolla for their leadership on this issue. It is so, so important to the future of our country. And I'd like to turn things back over to Anita Maquat. Thanks, Dwight. Thank you, Wes, Rolla, and all our panelists for a thought-provoking inspiring and at times emotional discussion today. I'm proud to say that my own organization, PwC, has signed on to the Black North Initiative and as have several other companies who want to take action and frankly, whose employees are demanding action. If you're interested in joining, donating or supporting the Black North Initiative, please go to blacknorth.ca to find out more. Thank you again to our sponsors, BLG, Morneau Chappelle, PwC, and Scotiabank for your support of today's event. And thank you to our AV supplier, Van Valkenburg Communications and LiveMeeting.ca for making it possible for us to come together virtually today. Guests, thank you for joining us. Please stay healthy and safe.